I've been going to Alaska's Brooks Range for over 40 years. At first I went to climb mountains and raft rivers and ski across the tundra in winter, but these days I go for new reasons that have to do with science and young people from the university where I teach. So we've been walking tree line, shown here in purple, linking our 20 tree line study sites by foot and pack raft, pretty much from Canada to Kotzebue. The students who come with me include a bunch of uh, kids I picked from my stats classes. There's clockwise from left, Toshio the teenager, Russell the mathematician, Julia the artist, Maddie the deckhand, Scout the musician, and in the lower left corner there's Alan the Yupik mountain guide from Bethel. Together we walk across the mountains on month-long 300-mile expeditions, collecting data on tree lines, deploying data loggers, mapping vegetation en route, and comparing it to satellite images once we get home. Besides being one of the fastest changing climates in North America, it's the biggest protected conservation complex in the U.S. and among the best places for wilderness travel on Earth, with rivers shallow enough to wade, deep enough to float, and clean enough to drink without treatment. Nameless valleys and shining mountains offer easy hiking and wonderful views. There's generally not too much brush, but plenty of wood for campfires. The light is fantastic, and in the summer, it never really gets dark. So, to mix science and adventure requires that we travel light and get along. We share tents, cook pots, food, and good positive attitudes. To save weight, our tents have no floors. We bring sleeping quilts rather than sleeping bags, and we make our gear do double duty, like supporting our tents with paddles or trekking poles. We carry pack rafts to cross and float rivers and paddle lakes. These rafts are light and compact and inflate quickly and easily. The raft carrying the three young women on the right weighs 11 pounds. The one that Toshio paddles on the left weighs 7. They're well worth their weight for the chance to get off our feet and get the load off of our backs. While summer days in the Brooks Range can be hot and dry, they can also be cold and wet, and we had our share of those and mosquitoes and wet tussock tundra and wasp stings and bad brush, but art and music and laughter, campfires and plenty of food, with pre-placed food drops every week to five days, those kept our spirits high. Some of the changes we've seen are innocuous, like a 12-year-old spruce growing in an alpine tundra of dryest lichen and blueberry, but other changes more sinister. The so-called shrubification, like this explosion of willows and alders across the Arctic during the last few decades, or the discoloration of streams and rivers by minerals leaking out of recently unfrozen ground all across the Brooks Range in just the last few years. This is climate chaos, expressed as permafrost thaw, draining ponds and lakes, collapsing forests, leaching minerals, drying tussock tundra, and even moose trapped in slumping mud like ancient bison in the La Brea tar pits. Shrubification is more than just vegetation change. It's changed migration routes of the caribou who don't want to push through head-high brush. Now the caribou aren't showing up where the subsistence hunters expect them to, and the locals blame the out-of-town trophy hunters for the caribou's disappearance. Here's Julia's illustration of Brooks Range Change, inspired by 700 miles and 10 weeks of wilderness travel and observation. Landslides and slumps, staining and draining, drying tussocks, disappearing sheep, moose, and birds. Which brings me back to this seedling on a tussock. This is a natural response to a warming climate that's drying out the Arctic tundra and making it hospitable to a native species at the edge of its geographic range. Spruce, like these in the Kobuk Valley, have moved no farther than this since they arrived downstream about 20,000 years ago. The oldest here in the photo dates from the 1700s, but until less than 100 years ago, none of them had made it over the mountains and into the Noatak Basin where they've been absent since the last interglacial 75 to 100,000 years ago. These seedlings you see, they're all less than 20 years old and they're germinating on top of a low mountain. In fact, there are spruce seedlings another dozen miles north. There are thousands of spruce here. The oldest arrived as a seed blown over the mountains by winter winds in 1922, and now they are thriving. The little one's only six years old and the big one is about 60. While I know these spruce, are the result of anthropogenic climate change. It's my hope that my students see the value in large wilderness like this, that big wilderness can absorb the change we humans have wrought like it has in the past, or can it?